Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. My name is JC, and we will get started in just a minute. Thanks for being here. If you need to get an extra cup of coffee, run to the restroom, whatever you need to do, uh, go ahead and do that. Muy buenos días y gracias por estar aquí esta mañana. Si necesita interpretación, estamos brindando ese servicio el día de hoy, como siempre. Usted puede oprimir el botón al fondo de su pantalla que dice interpretación y escuchar la presentación como gusta. Si tiene algún problema con la interpretación, por favor avísenos cuanto antes por medio de la charla y estaremos pendientes de eso. Gracias por estar aquí y bienvenidos a Sinergia. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. We're just going to get started in a couple minutes. Get in, everybody get situated. Uh, but thanks for being here on time. Really appreciate it. And uh, yes, you are here for the transition into adulthood uh, webinar. So you're in the right place. Grab some coffee, a uh, second cup of coffee, maybe for some of you. Uh, but yes, thanks so much for being here. And we'll get started in just a second. Enjoy the music. Who doesn't love MJ, right? Good morning, everybody. If you're just getting here, uh, we'll take a couple of minutes so everybody can get situated. Uh, but yes, welcome to Synergia, and we'll get started in just a second with our Transition to Adulthood uh, webinar. Thanks for being here. Muy bien. Bienvenidos todos. Gracias por estar aquí esta mañana. Si necesita interpretación, por favor, escoge el botón al fondo de la pantalla que dice interpretación y ahí usted podrá escuchar esta presentación en español. Gracias por estar aquí esta mañana. Good morning, Miss Alvarez. Thank you so much. Good to see you. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the Michael Jackson. I know I do. Never get tired of MJ. Um, and I haven't seen the show yet. For those of you that live here in New York, I haven't seen it yet, but I hear it's amazing. Um, hopefully, I'll see that sooner than later. Uh, so good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for being here uh, for our, our presentation this morning on transitioning to adulthood. Um, my name is JC Cortez, and I am the Director of Training and Development here at the Metropolitan Parent Center at Synergia. Um, a few words about Synergia. We're a multi-service agency that's been serving, um, supporting New Yorkers with disabilities and their families for the last 40 plus years. We offer a rich source of information and training tailored for parents, including parents whose primary language is not English or who they themselves may have uh, special training needs. Uh, we help them uh, participate more effectively in their children's education and development, and we partner with professionals and policymakers to improve outcomes for all children with disabilities. Synergia, which is Spanish for synergy, is one of New York City's three federally funded parent centers committed to serving people with disabilities uh, with an added focus on communities of color and the economically disadvantaged. Synergia creates innovative programs uh, for transitional housing for homeless families who have children with disabilities, 
community residences for people with developmental disabilities and parenting and education advocacy training for parents of children with disabilities. So thank you for being here. And uh, yes, uh, absolutely happy that you could join us this morning. If this is your first time, welcome to Sinehia. And if not, welcome back. Um, it's good to see you. So today, uh, I want to just give you a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, we are recording this presentation and it is being broadcast via Facebook Live. Hi, everybody on Facebook. Thanks for joining us. Um, and yes, there will be a poll at the end of this presentation that I hope you can fill out. And if you have to leave early, don't worry. There's also the same poll will auto populate in your browser whenever you close this presentation. So don't worry, just please, we'd love your feedback on how we can do better and what we're doing right. So uh, thank you so much. Also, I encourage questions at any time. Uh, happy to answer them. And, um, and yes, I know sometimes presenters say, oh, well, save it for the end for the Q&A. And honestly, like sometimes if it's me, I don't know about you, but um, I'll forget it by the time we get to the Q&A. So, or maybe I'm not gonna be here because I have to run for some unexpected reason. So please ask your questions at any time. Um, I will try to answer them, especially if it's aligned with where we are in the presentation. Um, so yes. Uh, and then I will be sharing with you, those of you who attended on um, the uh, slides for this presentation. So you'll have that as well, and plus the link to the recording. It'll be made, avail uh, bleh, made available immediately uh, on Facebook if you want to check it out, or if you miss some of it, don't worry, it'll be there. Um, so yes, um, I believe that's it. I also want to extend a warm welcome to my interns, my summer interns that are here. Um, they are joining us and I have um, eight, eight or nine high school interns uh, that are supporting us in the work that we do and who are eager to learn more about transitioning to adulthood as Synergia and our uh, collaborative, Parent Center Collaborative here in New York, which is Advocates for Children, um, include NYC and the Long Island Advocacy and us are putting together an event um, in October uh, on self-advocacy and what we can learn and how we can support parents of teaching self-advocacy skills to our youth with disabilities. So please uh, give us some feedback on those surveys and uh, anything in the chat. We're, I have your questions. I wanna thank everybody who submitted questions. Uh, we will try to answer all of those throughout the presentation. All right, so, and I will try and keep an eye on Facebook. So if you have questions there, uh, I will try to be watching. So thank you so much. Um, Yes, let me see. see um, I'm checking Facebook now. Si ustedes desean escuchar esta presentación en español, pueden este, inscribirse por medio de Zoom y pueden ver este, ya en cuanto se escriben, podrán ver la presentación con interpretación simultánea en español. Este, y si llegan a tener algún problema con la interpretación, por favor, coloque esa información dentro de la charla y este, estaré vigilando eso, ¿ok? Uh, any questions or concerns that you may have, please place them in the chat. Uh, good morning, Lamisa. Great to see you. And uh, or you can also place them in the uh, Q and A section. Um, so uh, yes, unfortunately, I cannot address technical issues throughout this presentation, as it's just me. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, um, and you will be able to see uh, where we are with the presentation. Let me get there. And here we go. All right, so welcome to the presentation on principles of inclusion, transitioning to adulthood. Uh, my name is JC Cortez, and I am the Director of Training and Development. Uh, we've spoken about what Cine, who Synergia is and what we do, uh, but yes, we do offer parent trainings throughout the year related to special education and designed to help you understand more uh, give you more knowledge and to enhance your advocacy skills. We also provide one-on-one -on -one -to -one bilingual special education assistance uh, in Spanish to English um, to help parents resolve special education issues. Um, we have the Autism Initiative, which provides support and training for parents of children with autism. That includes an after-school arts program that we do in collaboration with the Guggenheim, as well as a social skills program for youth with disabilities uh, that are transitioning into adulthood. So uh, if you have a youth with a disability, we offer that program. Typically it starts in October. And if you're interested, uh, please reach out and we can connect you with that program. 
Um, but yes, it basically is a program that supports uh, youth with autism in creating a safer space and where they can talk amongst other peers their age, uh, guided by behavioral specialist and a facilitator to talk about issues that are important to them, right? That maybe they don't want an adult hanging over their shoulder or their parent. Um, so that they can talk about it and discover that and socialize, right? Because we know socialization is a real challenge uh, for those with autism. So uh, that's something that we do offer. So if you're interested in that, let us know. Uh, and yes, and last, like I mentioned, we're one of uh, New York City Parent Center Collaborative here in the region. And you'll see here on the right, that includes Advocates for Children and our friends that include NYC and also the Long Island Advocacy Center. As I mentioned, we work on projects together one of them being the self-advocacy event. Uh, it will be a film that we're producing that my interns are working on. They are taking notes throughout this presentation, I hope, hint, hint. and uh, yes. So the agenda for today, the agenda for today is gonna to be what we should be considering for future consideration as parents, caregivers, and, uh, and also before I continue, I wanna extend a warm welcome to those professionals that are joining us so that they can understand how to support parents better and also how to support youth with disabilities uh, as well. Thank you for all the work that you do and thank you for being here to try and learn more. We appreciate you. Um, so yeah, so what do we wanna consider for future consideration, uh, right? What do we think about? What happens after 18? What does it look like? What should we be thinking about? Um, you know, like, you know, even though my child is five years old, 18 seems like forever away and then all of a sudden he's here tomorrow. So what should we be thinking about? We wanna understand also what is transition uh, and then what the process is, the timelines, who's involved, right? Because there are some laws and rules, right? That, you know, kind of guide things that we should hope. Um, so we'll talk about that so that you know what they actually are. Um, and then keys to active parent participation, right? What should you be doing? What, how can you support the process even more, right? It's not just about being present, it's about being engaged, being active, right? Um, where can you find uh, information on transition within your child's educational documents, right? Where is it in the IEP? Um, you know, the IEP is already like 20 pages long. Where is it? Where can I find it? So we'll talk about that so you can find it with greater ease. And then we'll talk about the statement of needed transition services, what that looks like. We'll talk about what transition planning is versus transition services. Is it the same thing? It sounds the same. Is it just another word? Is it interchangeable? So we'll talk about that too. And then understanding the student exit summary. What does that mean? What is the student exit summary and why do I need it? What function does it serve? Also opportunities that exist beyond uh, high school, right? I mean, we can't stay uh, perpetually in high school. Um, you know, even if we don't graduate, we age out at 21 typically, right? Uh, it might be 22 or 23 because of the pandemic. Um, but only for these past couple of years. That's not typically the way the law has been written. Um, and also what happens at age 18? I mean, I know they're an adult legally, but what does that mean? And what do you need to do? What do they need to do, right? Because the responsibility falls on them um, if there are no arrangements in place. Um, we'll give you some tips and suggestions, and then I'll walk you through a resource list that I've put together that I hope you'll find helpful, uh, digital resources, uh, so yes. Um, so when you're considering your child's future, what should you be thinking about, right? Um, what are your hopes and dreams for your child, right? What are your hopes as a parent? Um, you know, once they've completed high school, where do you see them? What do you, where do you want them to be? You know, where you're like, I want them to be able to live independently. I want them to be able to be happy. I want them to be able to support themselves, right? Or find some sort of uh, the right place for them. You know, that looks so different for so many people. We have different goals. I mean, my, my parents were like, you know, you're gonna be a lawyer, you're gonna be a doctor, but you know, like I'm neither. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't always work out, but where do we see them? Where do we like, where, we have to do an assessment of our own, you know, um, internally. How can you help your child prepare for employment, post-secondary education or independent living? You know, what does that look like? Can I teach my child how to be punctual? Can I teach my child how to express themselves and express their needs? Um, if they're going into university or college after high school, you know, what can I do to support them? Um, what can I teach them so that they can make sure that they're being supported when I'm not there? I can't be with them at every uh, given moment in time. 
Um, and unfortunately, we don't la we don't live forever either. So we have to think about those things too. Um, so yes, um, and independent living. You know, does my can I teach my child how to do their own laundry? Um, can I teach my child, you know, how to get the mail and like understand like bills and like all of that financial management? Those are things that we want to think about too, right? Because we don't really get a class in in how to balance your checkbook. I mean. Thank goodness for apps, right? Because they tell us what our balance is, but uh, do they understand what that is? Do they understand how it is to use cash? Those things, right? Um, how can we be a better, more effective advocate for our child during the transition process? Uh, you know, that process, what does it look like? How can I make sure that my child is like advocating for themselves while I'm also advocating for them? How can they be complimentary, uh, right? Uh, we want to start to incorporate their voices as much, as soon as we can. Uh, you'll hear me always say, you know, bring your child to an IEP meeting, not for the entire, you know, one to three hours, but, you know, just bring them just for the introduction, you know, like, hi, this is my child. I want you to see him. I want you to engage with him. You know, like, there's more to what we are looking at on paper than, you know, in our conversation. This is an actual human being, a beautiful human being. How can we support this human being to be fully developed or as developed as we want them to be on, you know, with all of the goals that we have for, that they have for themselves and that we have for them. So how can we be a better advocate? And lastly, of course, and I've been alluding to this as I've been speaking, what can you do to teach your child to become a self-advocate? How can we teach them, you know, to tell somebody, hey, these are my needs. Hey, this is my disability and this is what it means for me, right? One of the things when we talk about an IEP, the most important word I feel in the IEP uh, acronym is individualized, individualized education program. It's individualized because each individual has their unique needs. And the same is true for a self-advocate. How can they articulate you know, their specific individualized needs? So that's something that we wanna think about as well. Uh, give me one second. Uh, our other interpreter has arrived, and I just need to connect you really quick. Bear with me. Uh, and um, sorry, guys. This is why I do this beforehand. Um, bear with me, everybody. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. And I, my apologies again. Uh, so, yes, back to our presentation. So, yes. So, how do we teach them, you know? to speak about their disability and to articulate what they need. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna give you the law and we're gonna talk about this. Don't worry, you don't have to unpack it. We're gonna unpack it together. Um, so what is transition and what does it entail? What's in it? Uh, so under the law, the federal law, IDEA, the Individual with Disabilities Education Act, uh, it says that transition services are a coordinated set of activities for a child with a disability. And I'm gonna like give you a summary really because it's a lot. But we want to, you know, have uh, something that's designed to give results at the end, to improve academic and functional achievements of the child, um, also to facilitate their movement from high school into post-secondary life, by post-secondary life, life after high school, um, and what that means, whether it's, uh, you know, college, university, a trade school, uh, you know, uh, integrated employment, how, do they, how can they be supported in there uh, when they have a job? Um, continuing adult education. Maybe they want to learn Spanish. Maybe they, sorry, maybe they want to learn another language. Maybe they also want to learn, uh, maybe they want to get their GED in case they weren't able to get their diploma while they were in high school. Um, adult services, what does that look like? How do I obtain them? Um, independent living, community participation, right? Because we want to think about, all right, well, not everything after high school is school, right? Now there's no school. How do we fill that in? Uh, so we want to think about those needs, the strengths, their preferences, interests, and it goes beyond instruction. It also includes related services, community experiences, um, 
post-secondary life, whether that's employment or independent living. Um, so do they have those skills? So yes, we wanna talk about the process, right? When does this start happening, right? What are the timelines and who's involved? So New York State requires that transition services be listed in an IEP no later than when the child is 15 uh, or younger if deemed appropriate. And it must be updated annually, annually within the IEP, right? The IEP is always gonna get updated annually. Um, and it, once the child is 15, it has to include transition services. In New York City, uh, the Department of Education begins the planning process to all of this when the child or the student turns 12 years old, um, or, um, and this happens until the student turns uh, 21 or until they graduate, whichever comes first. Planning responsibility is with the school-based transition planning team, which is the traditional members of the IEP team plus supporting agencies. So what does that mean supporting agencies, right? So everybody from the IEP team is now a transition team. Okay, it's the same function. We still do the IEP together, except now we talk about transitioning, right? What is life after high school? So a note on agency participation, you know, not everything that you wanna teach a child is taught in school. So if there's like an organization or an agency that can support you in providing that supplemental education, this is where that agency can participate. For example, uh, if your child is OPWDD eligible, right? Uh, that is um, the Office of People with Dis Developmental Disabilities, right? So they have a developmental disability. If they're eligible, it might be great if we bring in somebody from the coordinated care organization to come and sit at the table so that they can hear what's going on and they can also help you develop you know, supplemental services. Uh, if it's something, I give an example always like, if you're a musician, right? And it's just something that, you know, the child is a prodigy, the child is like really wants to be a musician. Maybe they can't teach that in school. You can't teach somebody how to be a rock star, but if they have talent or if they wanna develop that talent, maybe you have an agency already in mind or that you've already been working with. Right? Um, some, uh, you know, maybe you go to the JCC and you're all, your child has been working there all, all this time on like different projects and different programs, you know, and it might be something that you want to include, you know. So that's the way you can bring in another agency, somebody that can help you uh, in providing and helping. And sometimes the school may ask you, maybe the school has somebody in mind already, and they say, hey, you know what? We know of an uh, organization or an agency that can come in. I was like, you know, and we can, and we can help, you know, provide that uh, connection. So yes, uh, so that's, those are some examples of what an agency uh, participating in this might look like their role. Um, and then you might ask, well, who's in charge of it, right? So we have the IEP team meeting. We always knew that the school, the uh, district representative was the person that actually was overseeing the meeting, right? Um, in this case, for transition, they're not overseeing the meeting. It's still with the district representative, but now we have a transition coordinator. And there's one in each school district, and it, they ensure the transition is happening and the planning is happening on time. Uh, and there's uh, the TLC, the transition linkage coordinator, uh, can also contact other agencies or bring them in or be that connection, you know, whether it's helping you with applications and making sure that they're done. Uh, in any of those related activities. So more on timelines, right? So the, you know, so we're, it ha the services have to be listed at the age of 15. New York City starts planning at age 12, right? So at age 12, the New York, New York City Department of Education is going to start doing the planning process. And what does that entail? That includes a level one vocational assessment, and that's completed uh, when the student turns 12 or, uh, and it includes students who turn 12 during the summer too. And it's updated every year, just like everything in the IEP. What's in it? So there are three components to it. There's the student interview um, to determine, you know, hey, what are your interests? What do you, what do you like to do? What do you want to do? Um, what do you feel your strengths are? Where do you feel your opportunities to grow and supporting you get there, to get there? Um, what does that look like? And that can be done by a member of the transition team and that can be a verbal interview, it can be a written interview, it can be with pictures and icons, say like a student is using a device to communicate, it can be something like that too. Uh, whatever the student's best way of communicating is, 
will probably the way that it's given to that student um, and the modifications and accommodations, of course. Um, and yeah, so it's just an assessment tool, you know. Also a parent or guardian interview, you know, like it'll be done in the parent's preferred language. First and foremost, that's important. Um, and it can be done in person. It can be done uh, at the school. It can be done over the phone. Now that we're in the pandemic mode still, it can be done virtually. So these are things that we want to know. You know, hey, parent, what do you think? What have you seen? What do you think their strengths are? It's the same thing from a different angle. Perspective is important. Uh, and like every time I'll, in any presentation, you'll probably always hear me say repeatedly, uh, you as a parent know your child best. No matter who has whatever degree sitting at the table, at the end of the day, you know all the history, you know all the facts, and you know everything about that child. So don't ever underestimate yourself and don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. Um, it's important you know that and remember that. Because you have, at the end of the day, it's your signature also that is going to authorize um, everything up until that child turns 18. Uh, as well, there's also a teacher interview, you know, so the current teacher will, they'll go through, you know, their records, you know, their grade books, they'll look at like their, the student's portfolio and see, you know, hey, you know, these are the things that I can identify that the student might have an interest in or that's really good at. Um, and yeah, so those are things that that's the part of the vocational level one assessment. I will say, if you don't feel, if you feel that there's not enough information from this assessment, you can, you are in your right to request a level two vocational assessment, which is a little bit more intensive. And there is a level three, right? So maybe, you know, we did the, we did the assessment and we was like, really, what did we really learn here? I didn't learn a lot, did you? Or do you feel like this? And so at that point, you know, hey, can we do something a little bit more, you know, we can get like, you know, more uh, um, more assessments involved, right? Um, and so you are able to do that. Uh, there is a level one, a level two, and a level three, but we always start with the level one. Um, so, all right, so at 12 years old, we'll start the planning with the vocational one assessment. Um, and then at age 14, what happens? So the IEP team will start discussing transition at the meeting at age 14. Maybe we haven't discussed it yet. Hopefully they have just because they've started the vocational assessment. Um, but you know, at age 14, it has to be discussed. Now this is like, okay, this child is between three to four years or more, maybe five about leaving school. So we really start, need to start taking these you know, transition planning and services a bit more seriously because at age 15, you'll remember the services have to start being included in the IEP. And at age 14, a student must, must be invited to the IEP team, at least when it comes to discussing transition services. So whenever that planning starts happening at age 14, the child must be invited. That's, that's a requirement. Um, it's not to stay for the entire meeting. It's just to talk and say, hey, you know, what are you feeling? You know, we started talking at age 12. We did that vocational one assessment. Uh, maybe we did it again last year. Um, but how are you feeling now, right? Because we're always evolving. I mean, students, the younger probably even more, right? But um, so we wanna make sure, you know, like, hey, you know, has that changed since the last time we spoke? Um, so that's something that we wanna consider. And at age 15, as I mentioned before, the IEP goes into effect that school year must include the transition services. So all the planning, all those assessments, all that talk, now it's being put into action. So how do you as a parent become more engaged? How do you as a parent like, you know, um, become more active, right? What can you do? You know, there's a benefit of the parent always being on the IEP team, right? They serve on that transition team in the same capacity so they, they can help the team identify the specific skills that their child needs, you know, like, hey, you know, my child wants to live on their own. They want to get their own apartment. They don't know how to do their own laundry. So maybe we can include that in some goals. Believe it or not, you can include that in your, your IEP goals. You know, it's not, remember, it's not just about academics. It's about the holistic development of a child uh, or youth in this case, right? Um, so yes, so those are things that you can consider. You know, it's not just, you know, you know, doing math, reading, writing, all of that. Yes, there is that, but also like now we're thinking like long-term. So you can help identify that, you know, you know your child best, you see what they love to do when they're at home, um, you know, when they're not doing schoolwork, what does that look like? Um, so share that information, right? 
Uh, parents should also be active in collaborating on school curriculum to ensure that their child will have the appropriate options available when they leave school, right? So, you know, you know, as uh, an example here, you know, like maybe we're not teachers, right? But we also know, like, I also know my child is a better visual learner than they are a tactile learner. So if you want my student to be actively like hands-on and that's not their primary way of learning, you know, you as a parent can say, you know what? Hey, I'm sorry, you know, I know you have good intentions, um, but this doesn't serve my student. This doesn't serve my child in the best way because they're more of a visual learner, excuse me. So that's something to consider, especially when it comes to curriculum. You know, we don't have to be a teacher to do that. Buenos días, señora Melendez. Gracias por estar aquí. Just uh, answering some stuff in the Q&A. Um, and yes, parents should share information with school personnel about student and family needs, activities, and goals. So this is, this is I think we forget about this often, right? Because we're like, you know, if, if it happens at home, the school doesn't necessarily need to know. But if it impacts the student, you know, it might be impacting them in their, in their mood, in their emotions, uh, and, and, and that state of mind, right? So, you know, like if there's a death in the family, you know, like maybe there's something we need to share with the school. Like they say, you know what, you know, they've been a little bit, my son has been a little bit like this ever since their uncle died or a good friend passed away or somebody at church, um, somebody from their childhood, something like that, you know, or maybe grandma and grandpa moved in and, you know, like it's kind of been an adjustment for all of us. So we might see my, my daughter more agitated, easily agitated, right? So those are things we want to consider sharing. Um, you know, um, my child has expressed an interest to start playing baseball this summer. So we're looking into that, uh, you know, whatever that looks like. So share that information because it can be used, um, you know, and it's also something you can consider exploring, you know, as like harnessing to help that child, you know, develop other skills, right? Um, so yes. Um, Yes, I will be sharing the PowerPoint. Yes, I will. Thank you for that. Um, and a link to the recording as well. Um, there's a question here. So the question in the uh, Q&A is when can we start the first transition or will there be a document that arrives? So there's no, you should receive the document, you should receive the notice that the vocational assessment is going to be done when the child turns 12 years old. Um, and then you'll go from there. Remember, at 12, we start doing the planning. At 15, we start implementing the services. We identify the services, right? So that's what will happen. Will there be a document that comes to you and says specifically, we want to start transition planning some, this year? Like, whether that happens or not, I wouldn't count on it. You know, I, it's important for you to remember, like when my child turns 12, I should be getting a vocational assessment. And if the school's on top of it, hopefully then we'll get that notification. Hey, we want to do a vocational assessment. As you, the parent, you know, like what would be the best way we do this for your child? As you, the parent, I need to do that interview for you or with you rather. And then uh, as you, the parent, you should know that the teacher is also going to be doing their part of the level one vocational assessment. So is there a document that arrives? Uh, I wouldn't count on it. Um, not, I wouldn't, honestly, uh, but yes. So continue with uh, how to become more active as a parent. Uh, parents should participate in selecting the goals, right? Um, and the kind of learning experiences that their child will have and what those skills will be look like when they're taught. Um, so, you know, like, you as the parent have the ability to, sh to shape the goals along the way. You know, I want my child to be able to do this by the time they're 18. You know, maybe they're 12 now, but how can we like implement steps every year to make sure that we get there, right? Uh, so you have the ability to say that, you know, whenever you're in those IEP meetings, you know, like, hey, does the parent have any, you know, any specific request? Um, maybe it's a change in services. Maybe it's a change in, in environment, right? In learning environment. Um, maybe it's a change, an addition of services. Maybe it's another evaluation. But also, you know, like, hey, in addition to being able to read on this level by next year, I want my child to be able to like start doing their laundry by the end of next year. Um, so that's something you know, that you can consider, believe it or not. Um, so yes, 
uh, and parents need to be able to work with professionals and other, and maybe other parents if you uh, are working together collaboratively in some sort of effort that way to develop more uh, appropriate options when there's a gap. You know, so like, all right, hey, we don't have that service, or we don't know anybody that can. You know, like being able to kind of like put your heads together and say, you know, like, all right, who do we know? Who do we know that might know? Somebody that does know. You know, how can we do this creatively? How can we think about this? You know, maybe we don't get it the exact packaging, perfect packaging that we wanted, but you know, we can get closer to where we want to be. So thinking about that. So where do you find transition-related activities? You know, in short, you're going to find them in the IEP. Uh, and what you're asking yourself, yeah, but where? They're 20 pages. They're 30 pages. I've seen IEPs. They're 50 pages. Um, you know, like where? So there are three sections within the IEP that you can find this. You'll see the measurable post-secondary goals, um, and that includes training, education, employment, uh, independent living skills, if that's appropriate. Um, and then the key word to this is the post-secondary goals, right? Um, and then annual goals based on age-appropriate transition assessments, that's another section. And then annual goals that document knowledge and skills that the student is expected to achieve. Uh, towards those post-secondary goals. That's a separate section. Uh, and an IEP also has to include a statement of needed transition services after the age of 12. So what does the student need? You know, that statement of needed transition services are just all the activities, all the strategies um, that will help you and your child get to those outcomes that you desire, that you've identified, and that you want to be a part of those goals. So I took a blank IEP just so you can kind of look at it, right? Sometimes we're, we're better visual learners, even as adults, you know? And so, um, you know, where does it look like and what does it look like? So we hear right here at the top, in the middle, we see those post sec I don't know, I'm, I'm unsure if you can see my pointer, but in bold face here, the second section, we see measurable post-secondary goals, right? And we see the long-term goals for living, working, learning as an adult, we see that it also goes by section, uh, education and training, employment, independent living skills when appropriate. Uh, and then we see that transition needs, right? So this is what the needs are. And then we see the coordinated set of transition activities at the bottom half of this page. And we see here, you know, like what are the activities to facilitate the students' movement from school to post-school activities? And you'll see that it's not just about instruction or academics. We look at related services, we look at community experiences, we look at development of employment, uh, and also acquisition of daily living skills. We see here a service and activity. Who's providing the service? What is the activity? And then who's the school district or agency responsible? So, right, is the school district doing this? If so, who? Which department? If an outside agency is working on this, okay, who? We want to include accountability. Accountability is so important in any development of an IEP document, uh, but especially when it comes to transition related, right? Because then we know who to go to, who's responsible, and when something isn't happening the way it's already been expressed, we know what, you know, who to go to already. It's not like, who do I call? We are not, we don't find ourselves in that situation, hopefully. So I wanna keep going with where you can find it because sometimes you don't have an IEP in front of you, um, so, right, so we have all students in New York City have what's called a New York City Schools account, and you should be able to access this. It's called the NIXA account. You'll hear the people in the DOE refer to it as NIXA. Um, and yes, you can find this, and it's a really great website. It's getting better and better, um, you know, as websites do, as all new types of websites, and especially stuff where we have our uh, sites where we have our personal information and private information. So yes, so you'll see here, you'll have your name of your students. You can add a student. What about your students' grades? What forms you might need? Parent University. Uh, I would always recommend if you are looking for direct information from the Department of Education, check out Parent University. Uh, they have a number of, of resources and tools and recordings, um, and it's all free on a lot of topics that are like hot button topics with the Department of Education. And also, you'll always have the ability to report bullying. Um, you know, there are like four or five places that you can report bullying with real relative ease. Um, one of them is in the NIXA account. 
So what else can you find? Where can you find these transition related activities? Uh, and, and again, we're still in the Mixer account, so I want to show you everything that you can find here uh, that's transition related, right? So you'll see the grades, right? You'll see assessments, what evaluations have been done? What's the reading level of my student? Um, a graduation tracker, you know, like we have to have like 54 credits by the end of four years. Where is my child in getting those credits, right? Are we expecting a, uh, my son to graduate? in four years? Is it going to take longer? How much longer? How can we plan, right? It's all about planning. Um, and also um, the IEP, you see a link to the IEP. You should be able to click on that and download a, a copy of the IEP. If it's not there, I would reach out to your IEP team and let them know that it's not there and they can take care of that for you. Um, so yes, you can also maybe contact the parent coordinator if you can't reach your IEP team, uh, but I would reach out to the IEP team first. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can see the students' documents, important documents. You can see their attendance record. You can see transportation. What type of transportation do they need? Uh, so, you know, if you have uh, special transportation uh, as an IEP service, that'll be there too. Uh, their current bus route, if they, even if they don't have that special transportation service, uh, and student wellness. So, it's a good resource to find all of those, all of that information. And again, if you're missing information, uh, reach out to your IEP team and they can help you. So we've come to this part of the presentation where we talk about the statement of needed transition services. And we're like, all right, we saw it in the on the blank IEP, but what has to be there, uh, right? Is it just a space and sometimes it's filled out, sometimes it's not filled out, it has to be filled out. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that. So instruction, it'll say where the instruction is taking place, what kind of small group it's happening, is it a 12 to one to one setting, is it where, you know, uh, is it done one-to-one? -one? Uh, when they're working with a paraprofessional, if they're working with a, a speech therapist, you know? So all of that has to be very specific and you'll see that. Uh, if, and it can be provided in a public school, a private school, at home or within the community. Related services. Uh, in addition to regular services, District 75 students can access travel training, right? What is travel training? Travel training is teaching a student how to get from their home to their school using public transportation, um, right? Uh, so that's the goal of it. At least within the DOE, they'll teach you uh, how to get from home to school. I know uh, our colleagues at YAI have an amazing travel training program that teaches them. It's a, it's a lot more intensive and lasts uh, about six weeks, I believe. Um, and it teaches uh, a young person how to travel from their home whether it's going to the store, or going to school, or going to work. Um, so it's a little bit more than what the DOE provides, but uh, that might be something that you can explore, you know, a, a good uh, first step towards travel training would be through for D75 students. Uh, so yes, um, and District 75, District 75 is a non-geographical uh, district, just in case you don't know. So uh, the, the city of New York is divided between districts one through 32, maybe 34. Um, and then we have District 75, which is, uh, it's not based in any location specifically, it's across the entire city, but it's for students that have higher needs, um, students with disabilities rather that have higher needs. Um, and then we have District 79, which is for typically non-traditional students. So uh, students that work and go to school part-time or that have some other arrangement um, that are trying to finish <clears throat> uh, at a later age, usually as well. Um, so that, so we have those districts, just a really quick, uh, I hate giving, using abbreviation and not explaining it. Um, so yes, also community experiences, you know, what can be provided in the community by schools, consultants, private providers, other agencies, nonprofits, right? Um, aid and employment, what does that look like? Is What can we do to help them get a paid job or a career opportunity that like really uses that student's activities and, uh, and interests? Uh, so yes, daily living skills, you know, what can they do at home? What do they need to learn how they can do at home? How can they do it better? Um, you know, maybe you just need that extra support and you can include it in your goals. Uh, so yes, uh, and then the functional vocational evaluation. So this, is a, this isn't automatically done uh, as a part of the vocational assessment that we discussed earlier, but it's something that's a, uh, it's an option out there and it provides information on job interests, career interests, aptitudes, right? Are they 
maybe like you're just like they have so many skills and I don't know what career is good for them right so maybe we have an assessment that can help us identify like oh you know like you know they're really good at science they're really good at writing maybe you know a career as a nurse might be something that they want to do something you know in the medical profession uh, maybe they would be better off as like a teacher of some sort right um, you'd be surprised uh, what those assessments can really provide uh, and yes if the IEP team, including the student and the parents, agrees that services in one or more of these areas is not needed, it has to be stated in the IEP. And it has to also have a rationale. What is a rationale? Just a reason, a justification. So if we're going to talk about Johnny as a hypothetical student with an IEP, you know, and we don't, we're not going to identify any related services, OK. As long as the student, the parent are in agreement with this, that we don't need anything in related services. In the IEP, it has to explicitly state, this has been agreed by student and parent that this is not going to be included. And it has to include a reason. It's not just because. Um, so yes. Uh, I see a comment here. Uh, bear with me one second. Mm. The, for me, I'm going to translate this. For me, they have closed the doors. Um, they have closed the doors and have always given me excuse on behalf of the personnel at the Department of Education. Uh, I'm in disagreement um, because it seems like they're always trying to cover up their mistakes at the Department of Education. Uh, they are not giving a good education. They always discriminate or punish. Um, I'm really sorry to hear that, that that is your experience. And, um, and you know, maybe you could use the support of an advocate uh, or special education assistance. Uh, we do it here at Sinohia, and uh, we also, um, our colleagues at Advocates for Children, including MSC, can also provide you some guidance whenever you're encountering resistance um, from the Department of Education. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. I'll put that information at the end. Uh, but yes, I'm sorry to hear that, and, and yes, but there is support available for you, so uh, don't get discouraged, um, so yes. Uh, also, if a student is OPWDD eligible, we recommend that they participate, they being OPWDD, uh, in, the, uh, in the IEP meetings, which I mentioned to you earlier, but uh, yes. So transition planning versus transition services, what is it? Is it the same thing? Are we talking about the same things? Is it apples to apples? Is it apples and oranges? Uh, so, right. So transition planning is assisting students and their families to think about life after high school and identifying long-term goals. That's all it is. How? It's a process that includes different parts of planning. Um, and that might be the vocational assessments that we talked about. Uh, and it also might be information that we're getting from parents, teachers, students. Uh, and school records. That's all it is. Now, what are transition services? That's different, right? So we talk about planning, but what are the services? So we talked about it. The law says it's a coordinated set of activities, strategies uh, to help support a student transitioning after life after high school for life after high school. New York State identified that ten areas have to be considered for this, and it's important, right? Because we think, all right, well, it's anything. It's academia, academics, and everything else. But what is everything else, right? So New York State has given us 10 areas that we have to look at, which is pretty comprehensive, uh, impressively. Uh, it's education, right? It also, it also considers the legal components, the advocacy components, personal independence, recreation, and leisure. We also know, you know, like there's more to work, right? We also have to have pleasure, play, even as adults, um, finance and income, uh, medical needs and health needs, employment, uh, transportation, and then post-secondary college or continuing education. Not everybody's meant for college and that's perfectly fine. So what else is out there? You know, well, maybe, maybe my child's really good with their hands and they can become an electrician. Maybe my child knows how to really assemble things and they can you know, become a whiz kid putting together our broken computers. <laughs> Um, so, you know, maybe they, they're really just artistic and they have that talent um, and you know, they don't need to go to a four-year university. They can go to a technical school and get the same skills. Maybe they want to be a barber, uh, whatever, whatever they want, right? 
how can we support them getting that education that will help them be successful in doing or getting closer to those uh, long-term goals? And then consideration of other support needs. So there's a student exit summary, and it's important that you understand what it is and how it can help you. The federal law IDEA, right, requires that a school district provide a summary on academic achievements, functional performance uh, in their last year of high school. So their last year of high school, you're gonna get what's called a student exit summary. Um, and it's gonna be more comprehensive. It's gonna be like its own kind of like separate document almost. It'll still be within the IEP, but it's, it's something that's separate. Um, and yes, and this is for any students that are graduating from high school with a diploma uh, or that's aging out at 21 years of age, which is the usual age. Um, so yes, and it'll include like, what are my child's abilities, their skills, their needs, their limitations? Uh, what recommendations is the school providing in the summary so that this, uh, the person with the disability can have support in the future, right? Whether that's from an employer, whether that's from an assisted living uh, center, um, adult services, what are those supports and what should they look like? This is what we've seen in school for this individual up until this point. This is their last year of high school. They're about to go out into the real world. These are the things that we've seen that have really helped and strategies and interventions that have been really beneficial to the development of the student. And this is what we recommend be used in the future. It's a recommendation, it is not it does not dictate anything, but a recommendation from professionals that have been working with the child throughout their academic career up until this point is really going to have a lot of weight with other individuals, whether that's an employer, whether that's a school, like if they're going to college, um, or an independent living facility, right? So those are things that we have to think about. And that's included in this summary. So that's why this summary is so important. The goal is to assist the student in establishing eligibility uh, for those reasonable accommodations and supports after high school in whatever setting that might look like, in whatever context. So we want to think beyond high school, what other opportunities are there, right? Everybody always says, go to college, go to college, go to undergrad, right? But that's not for everybody. Uh, so what other opportunities do exist? So there's vocational education, right? Training for a job that doesn't require a college degree. Uh, you know, um, maybe they're really good at coloring hair. Uh, maybe they're good at doing nails, something very technical, something very specific. Um, you know, maybe they wanna build things. Maybe they wanna paint things. Um, maybe they love like playing music, all these things. And vocational trades, like, you know, you can learn how to mix music. I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know that I ever could learn that either. So. Uh, you know, but we have to think about what our child's desires, interests, and aptitudes are. Adult education, you know, maybe a GED program, maybe it's learning another language. Um, it doesn't have to be something very formal, you know, but what is adult education? Um, and, you know, those are services that maybe once the child is 16, they can get outside of high school, outside of the school. Um, so, yeah, that's something to consider too. Uh, adult services and community services, you know, what services and supports are available for, for, for adults with disabilities, right? Because as we know, or maybe we don't know, actually let's assume we don't know, but the IEP, you have the IEP until the student graduates or ages out of high school. After that, the IEP is no more. All those services, all those supports, they're no longer required because the child's not in school. And IDEA, the federal law that dictates all of special education is directed towards schools. So once the student's out of school, all of that falls to the wayside. Uh, so yes, independent living skills and services, um, you know, life skills training, you know, how to, how to deal, how to cope, how to manage emotions, uh, how to like do counseling, um, also uh, supports that can help an individual with a disability to be independent and to thrive within their community. Uh, wherever they may be. Uh, Ms. Lewis, um, uh, there's something in the Q&A here. My son will be 19. Uh, I have always felt that he could use speech training outside of school. Can I advocate assistance to obtain what I consider functional training? Uh, he can take pictures with an, uh, on an iPad, record programs on TV, but he needs to be able to communicate socially. Yes, 
And so it's, this is a wonderful question. And yes, you can. Yes, you can. And uh, and yes, you know, if if the student is still in school, um, then yes, it's something that I would definitely bring up to the IEP team meeting. If it's not, if the student is not, if your son isn't, and maybe they're OPWDD eligible, maybe you can talk to somebody within the care coordinated organization that manages uh, everything because that can be a part of the self-determination plan for that student, uh, for, for that individual if they're not a student, right? Um, but yes, you can advocate that uh, and you can get assistance. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you at the end of this presentation, all those resources that you can tap into, uh, but thank you for your question. So yes. So what happens at age 18, right? Under, the I, under IDEA, the federal guideline, the federal law, states are required to notify students as to what their rights will be when they turn 18, which we call the age of majority. Um, at age 18, parental rights are transferred to the student. So all of those decisions, all of that authority that you had as a parent, once the child turns 18, it, becomes, it falls on the student. They will be liberated and this is not, this is typically the language that's used. I don't like this word, but liberated from parental control. Parental control no longer uh, exists. It stops, it ceases to exist at 18. Parents are also liberated uh, from responsibilities regarding their child as well, right? So, you know, uh, children are required to go to school until they have reached the age of 18, right? And if they didn't go to school, if like, they're skipping school, the school always sues the parents, right? You know, for truancy or what have you. Um, at that point, once the child turns 18 and they decide they don't want to go to school, nobody's getting sued. The, the adult, the student, now an adult, made the decision they don't want to continue. And that's, that's, that's their right. So, yes. So I want to take this moment also to talk about long-term decisions. This isn't a presentation on long-term decisions. Uh, this is on preparing for transition to adulthood. But long-term decisions need to be considered, and they need to be considered, honestly, before 18. So what am I talking about? Um, parents need to decide whether they want to get involved with guardianship. Guardianship is a process, uh, and it typically uh, should be discussed and considered when the student is 17. Uh, I would recommend even younger, uh, and I'll tell you why in a second. And, uh, but yes, when you start, you, you know, or you have a feeling that you need to support your child and have that authority, the legal authority to make decisions for your child after 18. That's called guardianship typically. And, you know, a guardianship has typically been the traditional way of doing that. And guardianship is you taking over all rights. Uh, so you maintain all of those rights as a parent and decision maker for that student uh, until that guardianship is either dissolved or ended uh, for whatever reason. Now, uh, there are some students who do not, who are able to make decisions, who have, can they just need to be supported, right? So they have like a circle, you know, what was it from, uh, oh, was it Parent Trap? I forget. Meet the Parents, right? Uh, that comedy film. And it was just like the circle of trust. I don't know if you remember that. Um, but, you know, like you have your circle of close people, whether that's, you know, your parents, your grandparents, your favorite aunt or uncle, uh, maybe somebody who's been really supportive of you throughout your education. Um, and that circle can be part of like your supported decision circle. Uh, so it's, uh, there's another phrase for it. I'm not using the correct term, so don't quote me. But there's supported decision-making option as well, which says basically, and it's gained traction, if I'm not mistaken, uh, just past the, um, the New York State Legislature this last session uh, in the last few days. Um, but yes, it is saying that I don't have to take all the rights away from my child with, with guardianship. I can, we can do something called supportive decision-making. And supportive decision-making is kind of establishing that circle of trust of all these people that the individual looks up to and really can uh, values their opinions and support and can use that to create decisions to support that individual moving through uh, life. That's also another option. 
So yes, um, I will be hosting a guardianship workshop clinic actually um, with colleagues from AHRC, with uh, Supportive Decision Making of New York, um, also with um, ACA New York, and um, I believe I'm forgetting somebody and I'm gonna get in trouble for that. Oh, and our colleagues at Cuddy Law, um, an amazing special education law firm um, based here in New York State. And we're gonna be putting together a guardianship clinic so that you can understand all of the options on the table. Uh, Today is not the forum for that. But I would say, and I was just saying this before, I would consider even before 17, especially if you're gonna need assistance filling out the paperwork. Typically the guardianship paperwork is long and a lot of it is very repetitive. And it's so repetitive that you start to doubt yourself. You know, did I fill that out right? Did it look okay? I don't know if I did that right. I need somebody to look over that. It would help if somebody looked over it. Unfortunately, because it's so self-explanatory, there's really not anybody that can really offer you that assistance. Um, and there are a couple, there are a couple of firms in Brooklyn. I think there's one in Queens, and then there's AHRC, um, which is actually our neighbor uh, here in Harlem. Um, but yes, AHRC provides that support for parents with uh, desiring seeking guardianship. But I'll tell you, there's a two-year wait uh, waiting list. So if you want to consider that before the child turns 18, you really need to start thinking about this like around 15, right? So that you can at least get on the list when the child is, you know, 15 and a half, so that you can at least when that, so when that child's about to turn 18, you can get that assistance. So be prudent about that. Um, hopefully the clinic that we'll host in October will be really beneficial to everybody if that's something that you're looking to understand better, whether it's guardianship or supportive decision-making or both. Um, but yes, an AHRC will be here and they'll tell you everything um, that they tell their individuals that they work with individuals. So we're really excited to do that. I'm still putting it together. Once I have it, of course, uh, if you're on our listserv, uh, you, you will find out that information as soon as it's organized. Um, so yes, so we're almost at the end of our presentation um, and I wanna provide you with some tips and suggestions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Miller. Yes, the court does help. And you know, you, what I have told parents is that, uh, and my colleagues at Cuddy Law will tell you this too, um, contact the, the court clerk. The court clerk is actually somebody that can really help you. Uh, thanks for that reminder, Ms. Miller. Uh, the court clerk can really help you in like going through it and say, oh, you know, this is wrong or this is wrong. You need to fix this. You need to fix that. Um, you just have to call them, you know, and get that support or maybe even go there. Um, and it might take a few times, right? Um, I've never done it. There's also, and, and I'm glad you said that, Ms. Miller, because there's also a tool built into the New York court system. And it's a digital tool like that helps you. It like has like little bubble pop-ups that help you as you're filling out the application, what you need to put in this blank. It's really helpful. Um, I haven't, I can share that. Uh, if that's something that of interest, please let me know. Uh, but yes, um, that is something that's also available through the court system if you can't get through to AHRC in a timely manner, right? Um, Ms. Alvarez, uh, I have a grandson who's 18 years old, adopted, uh, but we have a good relationship throughout his entire life. The parents are good, but lack how to advocate and communicate with anything related to services he could use. As his bio, biological grandmother, would I be able to get guardianship to help advocating in future decision making? So uh, I, can't, I can't give you specific advice on that, but what I can say is that it's something that you should explore more especially if the uh, individual has the ability to make decisions, um, but ultimately like uh, it's something you really kind of have to assess if the student, if, the, if your grandson can make those decisions, uh, if you feel that they're confident enough to make those decisions, if they feel like they're confident enough to make those decisions, um, you know, maybe supporting decision-making is something you want to do. Um, but guardianship is always something on the table. Um, you just have to come to an agreement within your uh, family, like how, what you think would serve uh, your grandson best. I, I know that doesn't give you any direction, but it, I hope it like helps you kind of like figure out who you want to include in on that conversation. Um, so yes. Uh, also, 
get your psychological evaluation. He's going, yes. Uh, as I said, this isn't a tutorial on guardianship, but it's a great tip. You will need all of those evaluations. And one thing that I would always recommend is whenever you're doing uh, evaluations, you know, get them done that last year. Make sure that you get those done the last year because you want like the most recent evaluation that you can get whenever you're applying for guardianship or you're applying for OPWDD eligibility. People are going to want to say like, all right, well, what's the latest assessment? What's, what's the last evaluation? When was that? Right. And if you can get the school to do it in that last year for the ID for the IEP, even better because you won't have to pay for it. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, and all you can always get independent evaluations at places that do them for free or low cost or a scaled fee. That might be also be an option. Um, yes, the Manhattan clerk to guardianship. So you can look on the New York courts website and I can include this in the follow-up email um, where you can find the court clerks because there are five, there are five boroughs. So it's all gonna be different uh, pertaining to borough. Um, if your son, Miss Lewis is 13, you can start considering guardianship and start having those conversations. Um, and yes, and you can always, you know, like um, talk to a professional, talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a neurologist, the child's neurologist. Those are options and start, you know, start having those conversations. Thank you for that question. Uh, and yes, you're welcome. Absolutely, Ms. Uh, Can you give us, yes, I will provide the link for the New York, New York State Courts uh, I believe it's the family law, I forget, it has a different name, but I'll, don't worry, I'll provide it in the email. Thank you for the request. And yes, absolutely, it's my pleasure to answer your questions, Ms. Lewis, thank you so much. Uh, so yes, tips and suggestions. Start thinking about uh, your child's transition to post-secondary opportunities when they're in middle school. That's fifth and sixth grade, in case that, you know, what that's supposed to be. Middle school is fifth and sixth grade. Um, start thinking about those things. Um, successful planning, like anything else, you have to make, you have to identify what you're going to need. In this case, support services. You have to involve those agencies. You want to like, all right, you know what? My child is like really musically gifted. My child likes technology. My child is like, has great uh, camera presence. You know, like they want to be an influencer. You know, like there are job titles that exist now that I've never even heard of growing up that I didn't even knew could be because we didn't have all the technology and all the things that we have today. So, you know, I'm not that old, but at least <laughs> I don't think, but, uh, but you know, like those are things that we can think of, um, you know, and like, how can we support them? What other agencies, you know, you know I, I don't like the expression, think outside the box, but you know, this is one of those mom moments or opportunities where you can think beyond you know, like school, you know, think like what else is out there? We live in New York city. We live in New York City surrounded by so many incredibly talented people and agencies. It's just finding them. And, and maybe that's working through networks, whether that's a parent network at school or a parent network that you have online, or maybe even your LinkedIn, if you're on LinkedIn, you know, that's something that you can look at going through people's networks and like you know, looking up that way. And of course, there's always Google um, to look at that and just make calls and inquiries, right? And remember, you'll have that transition link coordinator that can help you connect with agencies once the child is uh, 12 years old. So use that person to help you engage with other agencies too. Uh, make them work. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, teach your child self-advocacy skills. It's so important. Uh, we say this all the time, which was actually the genesis of this self-advocacy uh, film that we're producing with the assistance of my wonderful interns joining us today. And like, we're putting this together along with the, my colleagues at, at uh, Advocates for Children, including NYC and Long Island Advocacy Center. Um, we're putting this together because we always say, oh, teach your child self-advocacy skills. They should be learning self-advocacy since they're like, you know, walking in diapers basically but we never actually give like concrete examples. So, you know, like, what does that look like? Uh, you're telling me to do something, but you're not giving me an example. It means something different. It means something different based on my family dynamic. It means something different based on my culture. As a Hispanic male, it might mean something different to somebody else from a different background or culture, right? What's good for me isn't good for everybody. So, you know, like, hey, you know, like, how do I talk about 
uh, how do I teach my son to talk about their disability and, their, and to say what they need, right? So teach your children self-advocacy skills. And if you need assistance with that, tell me in the chat what you would like to hear. I'm sure my interns who are taking notes would love to hear it as well, because, you know, sometimes we don't know. We assume we know, but, you know, like, we don't know until you tell us. So if you have ideas, please, please share them. I encourage you, please share them. And just remember, it's never too early to start this process. It's never too early to start planning. You know, we have to think, we're talking about the individual right now today in our presentation, but we also have to think about, you know, what are finances gonna look like? How do we maintain that Medicaid eligibility? How do I make sure my child doesn't lose their, their benefits, right? Their SSEI. Uh, how do I make sure that they don't lose that if they do get a job? How do I protect that? What is an ABLE account? What is a fiduciary trust? You know, how do I make sure that if we win money from a lawsuit that it doesn't jeopardize my son's ability to receive benefits and, and you know, once they're an adult? How do I, you know, avoid the, the government trying to take away all, the, all of it in taxes when it's like for my son who has a disability? Um, so those are things that, you know, that we have to think about. And that doesn't even relate to what we're talking about to this transition, but like that future planning is so key. And I have a presentation, recorded presentation on future planning that I will include in uh, the follow-up email to this presentation, which will include a link to this recording and which will include also um, the PowerPoints that we've been going through. So I, want, I promised you that we would go through resources. Um, how old should the reports be for guardianship? I believe within two years, Ms. Lewis, I don't hold me to that. I'm not a specialist, but whenever we hold that clinic, post that clinic, we will definitely talk about that. Uh, Ms. Miller has shared, um, shared the link um, for uh, this and for the courts. She shared it in the q and I'm gonna put it in the chat in case you can't see it. And then, oh, you found the tool. Thank you so much, Ms. Miller. You are amazing. All right, and let's see. Here is the, here's the tool that can also help you complete that. The one that I was telling you that has like the little bubble pop up, that is the tool right there. Thank you, Ms. Miller, that is so helpful. I'll also include these in the email as well. So no worries uh, if you don't get them. So I promised to go through a list of resources and I want first to be, for you all to discover parent centers. Uh, parent centers are a federally funded uh, organization institution funded by the Department of Education, the Federal uh, Department of Education, one of them being Synergia. So it is federally funded, which means we have to vet all information. It's already been, you know, it's been vetted for you. It is a direct source. It is usually free. I mean, I haven't seen many instances, if any, up until my career, like uh, where you have to pay for something from a parent center. We have Advocates for Children in New York City. They have um, they have a legal staff, uh, lawyers, and you'll see their name in the news a lot whenever there's somebody suing the Department of Education on behalf of students with disabilities, immigrant students. Um, so you'll see that. Community Inclusion and Development Alliance, CETA, they're based in Queens. Um, and then we have Include NYC, which is an amazing source of information. Um, and the three of us, the, uh, and including CETA, the three of us work together. Also the Long Island Advocacy Center, if you're joining us from Long Island or Nassau County. Um, and then we have here in New York State, the Parent Network of Western New York, uh, for West New York, Synergia, which is the five boroughs. Uh, Starbridge is for everywhere except New York City and Long Island. Uh, and then we have United We Stand in Brooklyn. Amazing colleagues, and they're all wonderful and, and willing to help. Um, and it's free, and, and you can find information on all of our websites, uh, which I provided as well. Also, it's important for you to always familiarize yourself with the transition planning and the policies that dictate this within the Department of Education. So I've provided you with links to that, uh, so you can read that over. The Transition and College Access Center, every borough has one. It's a, it's a division within the Department of Education. They provide uh, assistance in how you can transition and plan that. Whether it's transitioning 
beyond that doesn't include college, or if it does, they are a great source of information. They can also help connect students with disabilities with internships um, and give them like uh, a number of workshops on a number of topics, both for students and parents. And, and I believe professionals too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and sometimes I host them. Uh, so uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, also, there's a guide from the Department of Education on what happens after high school. There's a resource on uh, how you develop and coordinate vocational services from the P12, which is by the New York State Department of Education. Access VR, what is that? Sometimes they provide assistance with textbooks and helping a student with a disability uh, continue their education and support their uh, education after high school. Also, there's something about social security, like there's so many things and it's just so complicated, right? Uh, what are benefits? What is SSSI? What is SSDI? What is the PASS program? What is Medicaid versus Medicare? How can I do that? How do I not lose services if my son gets a job? Uh, all of that. I've provided them in Spanish as well, as you see here. There's the mayor's office for people with disabilities. No matter who's mayor, there's always an office for people with disabilities, which is great. There's the Center for Independence of the Disabled, an amazing organization, which I hope to host in the near future, uh, that can support uh, individuals with disabilities um, as adults. And, if, and you know, we talk about expanding connections and looking for services. These are places you should go, uh, especially with the Center for Independence of the Disabled. Uh, there's the OPWDD, which supports individuals with developmental disabilities. That includes autism. That includes Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. Um, so those are things that you can look at uh, through them. There's the Office of Mental Health, which supports adults with severe psychiatric disabilities. They're the Self Advocates of New York State, an amazing organization of self advocates, basically adults with disabilities and how they are advocating to change the law here in New York State, how to increase awareness in New York State uh, to support people with disabilities. There's Project Shine. This center here is a uh, network partner in Project Shine. It's a, part, uh, it's a partnership and I oversee our contributions to this project. Um, for our organization, but it's seven organizations here in New York City. And we are all working together to support students with developmental, intellectual developmental disabilities, uh, whether that's with, um, with sexual education or sexuality, uh, questions around sexuality. So that's something that we work on. Check us out. Um, it's a lot of great work. We're just starting year three of our uh, grant. Um, and it's an amazing uh, opportunity. It's something that we've been developing. We're really excited because the one thing that we built into it that's so key and that we don't see so often anymore, despite everything that's happening around us, is it's built around equity. So, you know, what does that mean to a person in this culture or this background or that speaks this language? You know, how does that mean? How do we navigate issues around, you know, around issues that are of concern for a parent? You know, you know, so many parents think, you know, if I teach my child about sexuality or sex ed, they're going to go out there and do it. And that's not necessarily the case. So it's dispelling rumors and myths and concerns that have been passed down from generations or throughout our communities and really empowering both parents and uh, youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, so yeah, that's Project Shine. And for parents, you know, there's always parent groups on Facebook, social media, and there are topics of transition, OPWDD, post-secondary post opportunities, um, I always just say, you know, like if you're going to be a part of a social media group, just make sure you vet the information you're getting there before you accept it as that, right? Um, there's so many things, and we've noticed in this age of disinformation of late that, you know, like maybe it's not necessarily based so much in fact as we think it is or hope it is. So just make sure you're getting that. And if you get information that you don't know or that you're unsure if you should really accept it, you can always throw it at us at a parent center. You know, you put us to work. You know, we're here for you. This is paid for by federally funded tax dollars. Um, so yes. So now is a formal time for Q&A in case you haven't asked any. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, happy to stay on with you. Um, but yes, I see something uh, from Ms. Alvarez. Audio and video keeps going in and out. Uh, I can send, can I send my ideas and comments directly to the agency? Yes, yes, absolutely. Send your comments and ideas uh, email me, you'll get the email from me. Um, 
uh, within a couple of days. Um, I always try and follow up within 48 hours, so we have definitely did that. And if you need the link to this recording, it's already on Facebook once I stop recording. So uh, yes, here is our information. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube. You can always uh, activate, we upload our videos to YouTube within 48 hours and you can always activate uh, subtitles in any language uh, through the amazing uh, artificial intelligence that exists there. We're on LinkedIn. Here's my contact information. I will share this with you. No worries, you don't have to take a picture or, or write it all down, we'll do it all. Um, so yes, that is our presentation. And um, I see Britt, you have your hand raised. Can you place your question in the chat or the Q&A? Um, if that's possible, that would be great. And then let's see. Let me check Facebook because I want to make sure we've answered any questions there. Um, refresh. And then let's see. All right. Yes. Okay. And all right. Britt, were you able to place your question in the chat? I don't see anything. Oh, I see the Q&A, hold on. Uh, you're welcome, Ms. Alvarez, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Miller, thank you for your support. I appreciate it. It's like I have a, 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 a person just over my shoulder helping me. I always appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Britt, I'm gonna actually let you come off mic. Let me just do that, so in case you have a question. I want to make sure you get to ask it. Britt, do you want to come off mute and ask your question now? You should be able to. Uh, meanwhile, um, uh, let's see. I don't see any additional questions on our Facebook group for those joining us there. That's okay. And then, so those of you looking for, to contact our intake line, if you need any additional assistance from Synergia, I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. Um, and then, let's see. You can always check out our calendar. Um, but yes, when you signed up for this webinar, there was an opportunity for you to um, add yourself to the um, listserv in case you're not getting our invitation. So that's something that's available to you as well. Britt, are you still there? Um, Muchísimas gracias a usted, señora García. Gracias por estar aquí. Sí, sí, sí. Espero que le haya ayudado mucho. Just seeing some comments in the Q&A. Uh, all right, so any other questions? All right, well, seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and activate a poll. Um, if you're interested in OPWDD services or learning more about what Synergia does, uh, please join us. My colleague, Joanna Santana, she is the Director of Family Support Services and my colleague, Tatiana Calderon, uh, she is the coordinator for the Autism Initiative here at Synergia's uh, Metropolitan Parent Center. Um, I will be joined by them on Wednesday of next week, and we will be discussing Synergia here for you, which will be just a presentation on what, what we do uh, here as an organization. And also, if you need to connect with OPWDD services and uh, family support, how you can do that. I'll put the link uh, for the, our calendar event there in the website, and I'll also be sharing it with you in a follow-up email. So that concludes our presentation today on transitioning to adulthood. And I am going to activate this poll, and we are going to have a great time listening to one of my favorite people, Lizzo. Muchísimas gracias a ustedes, señora Peña Brown. Gracias por venir. All right, I'll activate that poll now.
thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate your comments. Look forward to hearing from you. If there's anything I can do, uh, you will have that information soon enough in your hands. I appreciate your attendance. Please complete the survey, and I'm going to leave you some good jams because I love this chick. Um, but yes, I will activate that now. Would you honor? Mm -hmm. Bad bitch, a crap, yeah, it's big, pretty. I'll be 